Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. If you are new, I invite you to subscribe. It does mean the world. If you are a returning viewer, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, both. Either way, it means the world. I am so, so very excited to be finally filming this video, which I have been wanting to film for the past six months when this journey began in 2019, which is part of my Women of Walt Disney Imagineering series, and I will link that playlist in the iCards. Um, I have thus far done a deep dive into Harriet Burns, Alice Davis, Leota Toombs, and Dorothea Redman, and Mary Blair is the one I was saving for last. Not that I don't have more videos on women, uh, the women of Walt Disney Imagineering coming down the pike, but as far as the OG ladies that founded the, literally helped create brick by brick the empire that we know today and the art that we love today and the nostalgia that feeds our souls every day. Uh, Mary Blair, I was saving for last. And there's been quite a bit of a gap since I uh, uploaded my last video, um, six months in fact, and uh, that's just because I started a new program with grad school and my filming schedule has been a lot more limited. So needless to say, I am super effing excited to be filming this and I have not one, not two, not three, four pages of notes on the queen herself. So without further ado, grab your cocktail. I'm doing a Tarantus moment. And um, yeah, let's get into it. So cheers y'all to Florida. Oh. oh yeah, I am filming this in quarantine. So can't wait for the world to reopen so we can all go back to Disney. Anywho, Mary Blair, where to begin? I think Mary Blair is probably one of the more, more well-known names if you were to say, you know, name a, a woman Imagineer, a female Imagineer. I'm not going to get caught up in pronouns and semantics in this series. Um, I've addressed that before, so if I don't use the right term in the right sentence, you know what I mean. Um, but in terms of her notoriety, I think her name recognition probably, maybe next to Leota Toombs, is, is pretty well known. Um, prior to doing this project and doing the research on these women, I only knew who Mary Blair and Leota Toombs were. Uh, Leota Toombs, uh, infamously known as the um, head in the crystal ball in the haunted mansion. But if you watch that video, you will discover so, so, so much more about her contributions to the company and to the parks and to the art that, again, we all know and love. Um, and also prior to filming this series, I had no idea who the other three women who are in my playlist up to this point were. Alice Davis, Harriet Burns, Dorothea Redman did not know their names. I knew their work, which I came to realize after doing my research. Um, I would walk by, you know, Alice Davis's murals in the Magic Kingdom. You know, the, there's rides. <laughs> I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean wouldn't exist without Harriet Burns and Alice Davis. Um, you know, the Tiki Room wouldn't exist without Alice Davis. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. Dorothea Redmond's murals. I, 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 you're getting me started. You're getting, you're, you're already getting me worked up. Uh. But anyways, I knew Mary Blair from my memories growing up, going to Walt Disney World, you know, uh, on the reg, um, from It's a Small World. That was what I knew her from, I guess I, guess I should say that's my earliest um, memory of uh, knowing her work was it, It's a Small World. Um, Beyond that, um, her mural, which we will get to towards the end of this video, inside of the Contemporary Resort at Walt Disney World, which if you've ever had the pleasure of going or haven't, um, I highly recommend that you, you take a moment out of your trip and go into the Contemporary, whether you're staying there or not, and see her mural that's been there since 1971. Um, on the Grand Canyon Concourse. It'll take your breath away. And you can also see it if you're on the monorail as it drives through. But it's worth it to take a moment and go in there and really drink it in. So I knew her from It's a Small World. I knew her from the Contemporary Mural. Um, and I knew her having had a hand in stuff like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, but I didn't really know the extent of her um, animation 
kind of portfolio or resume, if you will, um, until I was doing this research. So because I am such a diehard Disney person and because my memories go back to me being actually in the womb uh, or me going goes back to me being in the womb and memories go back to being an infant in a stroller, all of this stuff is so deeply embedded in who I am, in my DNA, um, that it just uh, pisses me off <laughs> that these women don't have more stuff uh, written about them, they're not showcased more, um, and so that was part of the reason why I decided to embark on this journey. Um, I'm wearing my teacup shirt, it's not Mary Blair, but it's as close as I've got. But um, in doing this research, I, this is actually new research, um, I just found out about this book which comes out in October um, this past week when I was doing Mary Blair homework, but there is a book coming out in October which will be available on Amazon called Women, Imagi Women of Imagineering, 12 Careers, 12 Theme Parks, and it's going to feature 12 uh, female Imagineers from the company. Um, However, most of these Imagineers are um, a, a lot more modern, a lot more, um, a lot of their work is uh, more recent, and um, you have women like um, Julie Svensson, whose parents were part of the company, um, you have Eli Erlinson, you have, um, I'm not going to remember everybody's name right now, who am I missing? Peggy Ferris, um, who worked on the Spaceship Earth mural. Rebecca Bishop. So those are just a handful of the women that are going to be featured in this book and whom I um, am working on videos for as well. But the other book that I wanted to mention, which I brought up in a previous video, which of course just disappeared, um, is by Natalia Hole and it's called The Queens of Animation. So okay, my life's falling apart. Um, Let's see if I could just get you a moment here. The Queens of Animation, I have the iBooks version. It's of course, focus up, on Amazon or wherever you get books. Um, yeah, so that is an amazing book. Um, I got a lot of information out of that on the context um, in which these women were working, especially during the 30s and 40s, during World War II, during the Great Depression. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that these first five women that I have videos on were all working before, during, and after this really, really um, profoundly disturbing time in world history and, of course, American history. And um, yeah, so The Queens of Animation is just a fascinating book, whether or not you're interested in Disney or Disney Imagineering or the women of. That book is just uh, fantastic if you have any interest in Americana or American history. I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, I was really disappointed, and I've mentioned this in previous videos, the, the utter lack of um, information on these women. Uh, it's getting better, but even if you go to the Walt Disney Family Museum, uh, which is located here in the Bay Area in San Francisco, which if you are fortunate enough to go, please make time to go. Um, having grown up in Florida and Orlando and Walt Disney World, I, until I went to the Walt Disney Family Museum for the first time in 2013, 2012, 2013, I did not realize the scope of what I did not know about this company. But even when you go there, they have this huge, amazing exhibit, you know, of the nine old men, the um, original um, animators uh, for the company, you know, going back to Up Iwerks. But there is almost no presence there from these women in any real um, depth or scope or scale. Um, so yeah, that I think will conclude my tirade, but you get the point. So. I'm just going to hit you with some quotes, okay? I'm going to hit you with some quotes um, from some other Imagineers, most of whom were men, um, and just what they had to say about Miss Blair. Um, Mark Davis, one of the um, original 18 old men, Walt Disney animator, um, compared her work to Matisse. Um, he compared her, specifically her use of color, 
to uh, Henry Matisse, which I mean, you know, high praise, right? Um, Davis went on to say that she brought modern art to Disney in a way no one else did. Um, animator Frank Thomas went on to say, Mary was the first artist I knew to have different shades of red next to each other. You just didn't do that, but Mary made it work. And that reminds me of the Imagineering story on Disney+, Plus, which if you haven't taken a moment to watch that um, miniseries, Fix Your Life and do it. Um, again, whether or not you're interested in Disney, that is an amazing documentary series on um, a huge piece of American history, in my opinion. And they do talk about Mary Blair a little bit in, in that, um, in the Imagineering story, and they do talk about um, her use of color and how she was playing, she was basically throwing the color wheel out the window. She said, fuck color wheel, I don't care about you, I don't care that this goes with this, or this is, you know, she was like, no. She was putting colors together that you just didn't put together, and she was putting shades of similar colors to um, his point, um, to Frank Thomas's point, like different shades of the same color side by side, which during this time, we're talking late 30s, early 40s, wasn't done. Um, so yeah, just to give you a sense of um, the fact that she was just blazing her own trail. Roland, uh, Roland Raleigh Crump um, said, and, and they collaborated a lot, especially on It's a Small World, both for the World's Fair, <clears throat> excuse me, and the attraction. Raleigh Crump said, the way she painted in a lot of ways, she was still a little girl. Walt was like that. You could see he could relate to children, and so could she. They were the same way. Um, yeah, so she, right out of the gate, was doing things very different from her peers, um, from her contemporaries, from people that came before, and keeping in context here that you have Alice Davis, Harriet Burns, Dorothea Redmond, Leota, Tombs, and of course Mary Blair being some of the original uh, Imagineers, uh, women Imagineers, female Imagineers. I'm sure there were more, um, but these are the ones that I was able to get enough information on to um, share with you. Again, the context and the time in which they were working, and that meant that they were one of a handful of women in a sea of men. Um, this was a time when women, you know, pre-war were very much at home, you know, homemakers in the kitchen, and then you had the war hit, and a lot of them had to go out into the workforce, and they were met with, obviously, a lot of disdain, and that's evident when you read the Queens of Animation, or even do, like, the, the slightest little bit of digging about the environments in which these women worked at, even at Walt Disney Studios. Um, it's very clear in my research that Walt himself was one of her biggest champions. He um, always fought for her, fought for her ideas, um, even when the male animators that she was working with and collaborating with uh, really found her um, presence a nuisance and annoying and um, found her actual style difficult to animate. Um, but just to give you a little bit of history on uh, Miss Blair, let me make sure my Florida's facing you guys. Oh. I have to tell you, Phyllis Torontes, 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 it's an accent on the E. So good. Oh. Anyways, Miss Blair was born in McAllister, Oklahoma in 1911. Um, much like um, several other of the women in the series that I've done thus far, uh, won a fine arts scholarship to this particular school, the, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, the Schonard Art Institute in LA, very famous um, in its time for being a, a reputable art school in Los Angeles. She graduated in 1933 with um, a degree in fine arts, and she did not she wanted to pursue fine arts, but instead of doing that, she went to work for MGM. She didn't go to Disney right away. She went to uh, become an animator for Metro Goldwyn Mayer, um, MGM Studios, rest in peace. In 1940, uh, she did join Walt Disney Studios. Um, one of her first projects was a short called Baby Ballet, 
Um, and it was actually a never produced segment of what was supposed to be a sequel or a second version of Fantasia. Not the sequel we got like decades later, but um, a proposed second version that was being worked on at the time that the original one was in the early 40s. And if you do have the pleasure and privilege of going to the Walt Disney Family Museum, um, they do have some of that footage um, playing there, which you can see. Um, in 1941, she would embark on a, um, a goodwill trip with the other animators at the company, Walt Disney Studios, to South America. Um, essentially, the Walt Disney Company had been, uh, or Walt Disney Studios had been invited to do kind of like this ambassador moment, like this goodwill trip to South America um, to increase relations um, and to, you know, obviously kind of study the culture and, and bring that back so that they could infuse that into their animation. This trip, and I'm going to circle back to this trip later on in the video, this trip it was like seminal for her. Um, you can see it in her work, um, most famously the Three Caballeros ride at the Mexico Pavilion in Epcot, which if you've not been to Walt Disney World or have had the pleasure of riding that, um, it's very much like it's a small world in the sense that you have animatronic dolls um, representing the nation of Mexico. Um, and it's just stunning. And when you get to that portion of the ride, I swear to God, if they ever change it, it's so beautiful. If they ever change it, like, okay, because there's talks that they're going to put Coco in the Mexico Pavilion. I'm here for that. Coco's fantastic. It's not just like some random IP. It's actually steeped in Mexican culture. I'm fine. I'm happy. Do not get rid of that portion of the Three Caballeros boat ride or strongly worded letters are coming. Anyways, her art very much captures Latin American culture. And you can also see this, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail at the end of the video in the contemporary mural. Um, it, it's just so evident. Um, yeah, so you see this trip inform her work from this moment forward with um, the animated short Three Caballeros, which is what the ride is based on, and another animated short called Saludos Amigos. Um, uh, her unique color styling was heavily, obviously, influenced by this trip, um, and you see her color styling um, be used, but more than it's used, it informs um, such films as Song of the South, which we can argue about this all day, I don't know why that's not on Disney Plus. We're all adults here. Put Song of the South back out uh, into the world. Take it out of the vault. That's an amazing movie. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna keep Splash Mountain the ride, but just erase all the history. Give us Song of the South back. Anyways, Song of the South, um, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Um, her influence is seen in Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, um, after this trip and after Three Caballeros and Saludos Amigos comes out, she takes a break. She tells Walt, hold on, uh, I'm gonna go do me, and she does. So this is 19, when are we? We're like 1941, 42, I think at this point. She takes a break and she goes off and starts a very successful build, uh, building business as a graphic designer. And she actually wrote a crap ton of little golden books. I have one of her sitting under there. Um, I'll grab it later. Um, yeah, so she had a huge, hugely successful career um, doing graphic design and, and um, illustrating little golden books. But everything changed in 1964 when Walt Disney was approached to create the now infamous exhibits and rides for the 1964-1965 World's Fair in Queens, New York, which um, not only changed the world, and I don't think that's an understatement, but it certainly um, was the um, incubator for dozens of rides that we now know and love. 
um, rides and attractions, um, and more than that, technology. So there you go. Um, so she basically came back because Walt asked her, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but Walt was like, we need you. Um, and we'll get into what was going on in between, um, or during rather her career as a graphic designer at the Walt Disney Company. Um, but yeah, Walt was like, we need you mama, come home. She was like, okay, I'm coming home. And what happened? I'll tell you what happened. What happened was she designed, conceptualized, designed, and helped create the It's a Small World attraction at the World's Fair. Now, the World's Fair in 1964, um, 65, was sponsored at that point by Pepsi, and they wanted to have a, um, they had a, part, Pepsi had a partnership with UNICEF, and they wanted an attraction that was um, themed around uh, children of the world. And so that was how the conceptualization for It's a Small World came about. And you see in It's a Small World both the attraction at the World's Fair and the um, larger expansion upon that vision, the It's a Small World attraction in Disneyland and eventually in Disney World. Um, you see that South America trip um, all throughout when you look at the various dolls, not limited to... Uh, the dolls of South American cultures, um, but you just see the color schemes and just everything. That trip really just shaped what she brought to the world. It, it shaped and informed her portfolio and, and just um, her as a person. Um, so yeah, anywho, uh, moving along, moving right along. Um, we know, of course, that the success of It's a Small World at the World's Fair is why they brought it to Disneyland in 66, and we'll get to that. Um, but again, going back to the times in which uh, we were living, if we can just put ourselves in, in, in a, the time machine right now, World War II is in full swing, okay? And um, the Walt Disney Family Museum, not to beat a dead horse, is so worth a visit because you learn so much about American history. Um, it's crazy. Um, Walt Disney Studios actually had, um, was contracted for how long? Um, between 1942 and 1945, 94% of all films under Walt Disney Company were contracted for training and propaganda purposes for the war. When you go to the Walt Disney Family Museum, there is actually an amazing exhibit on this, and you see posters with Mickey and the Fab Five um, doing, you know, um, anti-German propaganda, an anti-Nazi propaganda, um, very much obviously like Allied powers, pro-Allied powers propaganda. Um, it's fascinating to see um, like the original prints hanging there. It's it's just it's a whole thing. So. I say all that to say, Cinderella was in production just after World War II. Um, budgets were very tight. Uh, okay, so we know that Cinderella's in production right after the end of World War II. Um, Walt's asking her back. Um, she was reluctant to come back. Her and her husband, Lee, were pretty much starving artists in spite of the fact that she did have um, somewhat of a successful career as a graphic designer, but I don't think that they really saw the fruits of those labors until much later. Um, but yeah, her first job back was as a sketch artist, which for what would eventually become uh, Lady and the Tramp, and animator, no, not animator, um, Disney historian John Canemaker actually said um, her work on Lady and the Tramp looked like the work of five different artists. So. I don't know, that quote's taken out of context, and I don't know, like, what the rest of the context is, if he was shitting on her, or if that was a compliment, um, but either way, um, it's a compliment, as we know now. Um, what else did he say? K-Maker, uh, went on to say separately that she went inside of herself, this is a direct quote, she went inside of herself to find how it felt more than how it looked, and brilliantly communicated her emotions through imagery. 
So clearly he was a fan of hers, but um, those quotes came from two different sources. So again, I don't know if he came around or if he was always a fan of hers. Um, and Blair was acutely aware of like the economic strain that was uh, happening at this point because of the Great Depression and obviously the fallout of the war. Um, but she would go on to say, quote, the diversification of the business would be the salvation of it. And she's referring to um, things like the studios going from um, focusing on major motion picture productions to what they call package films or, you know, animated shorts um, instead of, you know, going after the big blockbuster money. Um, she did a little bit of work on something which I have been unable to find even on Disney+. Plus. It was one of the very first live action animated hybrids um, and it was a short and it was called So Dear to My Heart and it took place in Missouri which we know is where Walt is from. So it's very close to his heart um, and she based the aesthetic of that short on um, quilting, specifically uh, historic American quilts. And on Oh My Disney, um, which is a gr probably has the most in-depth information on Mary Blair, and I'll link the article um, if anybody wants to read it, she basically wrote Walt in 45 um, when she was working on this. She said, I have found a good book on American quilts and bought it for the studio. I think I should make a quilt now after reading it. It seems that quilt making is a revived art in this country now, which fact adds more value, which in fact adds more value to its use as a medium of expression in our picture. And of course, again, going back to history and context, people were making a lot of things at home with materials that they had i.e. quilts. So we have um, many from that era that, of course, now informed um, great Disney stuff. So what happens next is um, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and this is where it gets interesting. So Alice in Wonderland, a couple of things are happening at this point. So she's asked back to help with Cinderella, but Ultimately, everything that she did for Cinderella, design-wise, conceptual, you know, conceptualizations, um, and final products were scrapped from, from the film. There was too much pressure from other animators, i.e. other male animators, and from just the world um, that they, they couldn't risk implementing her eccentricities into Cinderella. They needed Cinderella to be a blockbuster. Um, or the studio was gonna fail. So, um, she actually created like these really interesting, and it would be so amazing to see these, I'm sure they're in the archive somewhere, but she ended up like conceptualizing and designing these dream sequences for Cinderella that were never, they never made it into the final product. Um, but they did get reconceptualized and they did make it into Alice in Wonderland, which Prior to this research, I did not know. Um, let's see, where are we? So, da -da 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 -da. so yeah, I mean, Alice in Wonderland, ironically, is literally made, that movie is made up entirely, entirely, keyword entirely here, by the abandoned dream sequences of Cinderella. And they just repurposed it with new characters. But knowing that Mary Blair is almost single-handedly responsible for the narrative, the design, the textures, the color schemes, and the whimsy and the psychedelia that is Alice in Wonderland just like takes my breath away. I just, I literally learned this fact. I was today years old when I learned this fact, honestly. Uh, Walt, this is another thing I didn't know. Walt was actually can you even believe, like, this is just, like, one woman's, like, four pages of notes. And, like, look how much we've already learned, okay? Or I've learned. You guys probably already know this. Walt was considering making Alice in Wonderland before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, okay? Like, I had... Like, my whole paradigm shifted when I when I heard that. Like, what? And Snow White was originally going to be a live-action animated hybrid with silent film movie star Mary Pickford. What could have been? Um, that's crazy. Walt was already make, like 
conceptualizing Alice in Wonderland um, before Snow White had even come out. I mean, was even in, even in production. Um, I, I can't. I don't. I don't know. What, I I don't know what to do anymore. So her sense of geography, her sense of color, and her quote unquote upside down conceptualizations were all featured and uh, were the foundation for what we now know and love as Alice in Wonderland. Now her art was, um, her style and her art was also featured in Peter Pan, much less so than Alice in Wonderland. Peter Pan, um, again, a lot of pressure for it to be a box office success. Um, they did, like, her collage type style, um, her chunky kind of forms, deep shadow work, high contrast, did make it into certain parts of Peter Pan. Um, Mermaid Lagoon, Mary Blair. Skull Rock, Mary Blair. Um, Tinkerbell, Mary Blair. There is, um, I can't think of the animators, the male animator's name that created Tinkerbell, um, but he collaborated with Mary Blair on her. Um, yeah, so the lighting and the color schemes of Peter Pan, that's Miss Blair, if you're nasty. Oh. So at this time, they're loving Mary Blair. At this time, um, she's art directing shorts like Susie the Little Blue Coop, which I have not checked if it's on Disney Plus, but I'm going to. Um, this uh, animated short, Susie and the Little Blue Coop, is actually what informed the idea for Cars. Who knew? Um, sadly, Peter Pan would be her last uh, feature film, um, any work that she would do on a feature film. And Walt was really, really upset both times she left the studios. Um, Marty Sklar, um, amazing Disney Imagineer, we would not have Pirates of the Caribbean without Marty Sklar, um, says that Walt was like really deeply affected when Mary Blair would walk away from the company. Um, I don't know exactly what happened at this point, but when they were working on Sleeping Beauty, which would be like their next princess movie following Snow White, there was obviously like a lot of pressure for it to be successful, yada, yada, yada. You've, we've, we've heard this before. Um, and they didn't, again, they didn't want to take a big risk and make it very uh, Mary Blair-esque. So they brought in Ivan Earl, um, an amazing Disney animator and Imagineer, um, to uh, design and animate for Sleeping Beauty. And he, thank God, was hugely inspired by Mary and had great respect and reverence for her. So um, there was a, a short um, called Little House, again, I've never seen it, um, that she animated and her, or that she illustrated for, and those um, informed Ivan Earl's animations for Sleeping Beauty. Um, and there's a really great quote by Ivan, if I can find it. And I'm, I don't know if it's pronounced Avon Earl or Ivan Earl. God only knows. Um, oh, fun fact. Sleeping Beauty was the first um, Disney movie to be filmed on 70 millimeter film and it had an exaggerated widescreen. Um, Ivan Earl went on to say, for years I have been hiring artists like Mary Blair to design the styling of a feature and by the time the picture is finished there's hardly a trace of the original styling left. Oh sorry, Walt said that. Walt said that. And then... Oh yeah, I lied. Walt said that. Um, yeah, Walt goes on to say that Earl's um, graphic approach to Sleeping Beauty was partially inspired by Blair's Little House illustrations. My bad. Um, it was Walt that said that. Um, so fantastic. There you go. Um, what else? So we're jumping around in time a little bit because this is the Alice in Wonderland Peter Pan leading up to Sleeping Beauty years. Um, you know, prior to that is when she had loved to become a graphic artist and she was doing like the illustrations for the little golden books, but it's 1964. There's that big jump in time 
uh, with the World's Fair when Walt calls her back. And that's how she got the work on Lady and the Tramp, which led up, of course, to, um, you know, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, and here we are where she leaves, finally, the Walt Disney Studios right around when Sleeping Beauty is in production. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. we did all that. What else? Talked a little bit about the World's Fair. Um, what's crazy about the World's Fair is Walt was approached for the idea um, to participate, and of course he had many more exhibit exhibits than just It's a Small World. He had less than a year to put the 1964-1965 World's Fair together. Look at what look at what Disney contributed to the World's Fair and therefore technology and therefore just where we are today in history. Don't even get me started. Bring back World of Motion, please. Okay, anyways. The World's Fair, you got to get into Mustangs and like go on a ride. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. So, Raleigh Crump, uh, Mary Blair's longtime collaborator, they worked on its small world, um, both for the fair and for the theme parks, said, quote, I think it hit her at the right time. He's referring to Walt picking up the phone and calling her to come back. Since it was about children, it's a small world, uh, the freedom of color in that Walt had asked her, end quote. Um, that was what we talked about earlier. Walt calling her back was, was one of the big reasons. He was her biggest champion. Um, and with It's a Small World, this um, one of the articles, uh, I think it's from the Oh My Disney uh, article, talks about the huge kind of oversized eyes that you see um, with her It's a Small World characters, and you also see in the Three Caballeros ride in the Mexico Pavilion at Epcot are apparently um, uh, reminiscent or derivative of an animated short she worked on called Penelope. Again, haven't seen it. It's on the to-do list. Um, the big saucer eyes is what they called them. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. She was championed for her ability to turn complex cultures into modern visual shorthand, plus her use of color, um, which you cannot really, there, there's probably no better example of that than obviously It's a Small World, Three Caballeros, but the mural, the Grand Canyon Concourse inside the Contemporary Resort. Like, if a picture tells a thousand words or a million words or however many words a picture is supposed to, to tell you, like, I don't know, multiply that by like 20,000 million. All right, so we did that. What else we got? This Oh My Disney article that I, um, got a lot of my information from, unfortunately it does not have an author attached to it. So I don't know who wrote it, who, who did this research and who wrote this amazing article on her, but they referred to her quote, distinct emotional temperature. And I just thought that was beautiful, beautiful exposition, whoever wrote on my Disney's article on Mary Blair. So um, in 1966, after the World Fair, it's small world was um, moved to Disneyland as a permanent expanded uh, vision and, and installation. Um, one of the saddest things um, that will probably ever happen to me in my life, knock on wood, um, is that I will never ever ever get to see Mary Blair's murals at Disneyland's Tomorrowland. This hurts my heart. Thank God there's still pictures of them online, but she was um, commissioned to when Tomorrowland, I guess, was in Disneyland in California, was getting revamped in 1967, um, there was, um, she was commissioned to do two murals uh, that would sit on either side of the Tomorrowland promenade. So if you've ever been to Tomorrowland in Disneyland, as you're entering it, that, like, that walkway is the promenade. And right, that, that first structure on either side those first structures on either side is where the mural was. Um, if you have been to Disneyland recently, um, it's now all Star Wars out because you have like Star Tours on one side and I think like Buzz is Lightyear Adventure or some bullshits over here. But on either side, they've done this very like graphic 
opalescent um, I mean it's really amazing it's really beautiful but it's very textured and structural spacey um, like texture like this cover over it um, it looks like pewter yeah it's awesome it's not Mary Blair um, so what used to be there on one side, I guess, was Adventures into Inner Space, and the other side was the Circle Vision 360 Theater. Um, Circle Vision 360, another thing that Disney brought to the world that didn't exist before, um, that was debuted at the, the World's Fair. But they covered her murals in 87, 88. Marty Sklar um, is quoted as saying that the murals were not neither removed nor damaged and these were tiles he says that somewhere under the various facades so if you were to take off that galactic bullshit that beautiful galactic bullshit but if you were to take that off and take off whatever was there before that which i don't remember under that mary blair's tiles her murals are still there for tomorrowland and he's quoted as saying, um, they're not removed, but encased. So they are still preserved physically there. Um, and maybe one day they'll get chipped away at. Um, so that leads us to um, the Contemporary Resort and the Grand Canyon Concourse mural, which is, again, as somebody who grew up in Orlando and Walt Disney World and only, you know, really started going to Disneyland in the past like couple of years as a California resident, um, Mary Blair's art was always part of my life, whether I realized it or not. And every time you would take the monorail through the contemporary, or every time you would stay at the contemporary, or every time you would just walk through it, have dinner, whatever, you're passing one of the greatest pieces of art, um, at least 20th century art. I mean, it's just, it's 90 feet tall y'all like it's it's 90 feet tall i mean it's absolutely beautiful it's just like this kind of western motif very influenced again by that trip to south america that the walt disney um, studios took um, in the 40s um, and you can see her influence in that you can see it um, with the way that she draws like the donkeys the way that she she draws the children, the Native American children. Um, it's all like taupey and earth tones. I mean, it's just stunning. Um, and it's just, it's just Mary Blair. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what else to tell y'all. Um, she's just everything. And ev no, I mean, I think about all these asshole animators that shat on her um, and couldn't like have the vision or like move their egos out of the way enough to um, realize that they were contending with um, somebody formidable, somebody who would literally um, not only inform Walt Disney, the parks, the World's Fair, the animation, um, its art, its characters, um, but the memories that literally millions of people have, um, if they could just see them, see the future, uh, they'd be, uh, oh, they're just sad little men, whatever. Anyways, um, there's not a lot of information on how she passed away. Um, if anybody knows, leave it in the comments. I don't think it was anything like horrendously tragic, but um, yeah, that's Mary Blair, y'all. Um, I just, oh, I should have brought it with me. It's downstairs, but I would highly recommend that you, oh, she died in um, July 26, 1978. I just don't know how. She has so many books um, that you can get on Amazon that are just fantastic um, coffee table books. Um, I would recommend The Art and Flair of Mary Blair is something that should be on every bookshelf. Um, if you have a child that's at all interested in animation or design um, or illustration, get them The Art and Flair of Mary Blair. Um, she's just a force and 
my god, like, if you could see the way that she used to draw on her eyebrows, like, if you didn't hire her to animate your major motion picture, like, clearly out of your mind. Obviously, Walt Disney got it. I mean, he got it. <sighs> That's Mary Blair. So, if you guys know anything that I didn't cover, please, please, please share it in the comments. It means the world to me. Um, I'd really like to know as much as I can about these women, and um, I think it's very important to disseminate this information because, again, whether or not you're a Disney person or not, um, these women had their hands on stuff that informs Americana and American history outside of and beyond Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company. Um, so yeah, if you know anything, um, please share it. That would be amazing. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Um, I have some of those other women I mentioned, um, some of the more modern and contemporary Imagineers coming down the pike. If there's any Imagineers you would like me to do a video on that I've not thought of or I don't know of, please leave it in the comments. Um, if, again, you haven't subscribed, please do. It means the world. Um, I'm trying to hit a thousand subs because uh, this might be the only way I make a living in the apocalypse. So help a girl out. And um, thank you guys so much for watching. And yeah, it means the world. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, yeah, cheers. See you on the other side.